So welcome to the to another keynote. Um, today we're going to be hearing from Shell Gentiman, who is a passionate advocate for open science, open source software, and inclusivity. She's a globally recognized expert physical oceanographer focused on remote sensing and has worked for over 25 years on retrievals of ocean temperature from space. In 2013, her work was recognized by the American Geophysical Union with the Charles Falkenberg Award. And was, more recently, she co-chaired a National Academy of Sciences report on open source software policy options for NASA. Today, Shell is going to talk about how the explosion of Python open source tools and the emergence of cloud computing collaborative workspaces are changing how we work together and how science advances. Um, just a quick note, we're gonna be collecting questions in chat. Um, I'll aggregate them and then we'll ask them all at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shell. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. And just to check that everyone can see that. Perfect. So this is about reimagining science. Science stands at the cusp of a new open science cloud enabled era. And I've dropped a link to a publication that we just, uh, that just went public that sort of outlines this vision. Advances in data, software, and computing are enabling transformational interdisciplinary science and changing the realm of possible questions. Deliberately designed open science communities can advance science and inclusivity simultaneously. Last night, I attended the Dask Down Under session, and this change is already happening, and now we need to support and nurture it. Dask is not only a key component of this new architecture, but the Dask community is demonstrating how interdisciplinary, collaborative, open communities solve problems together faster, better. So, I'm Shell Gunneman. I'm an oceanographer trying to understand how the ocean affects our weather and climate. My one and only coding class was LISP in 1992. From that, I advanced to Fortran, the only older higher level language in existence. I'm a remote sensing scientist, so I deal with big data. And I specialize in killing kernels by just trying to run really big analyses in part because I'm just trying to see what I can get away with in Python. I'm also the lead on a proposed new NASA science mission, Butterfly, and part of designing that mission includes thinking about how to increase the mission impact, which means improving how satellite observations turn into actionable information. And that's where these sort of communities lead the way. A couple of years ago, I learned Python and moved my research to the cloud with a lot of help from people like on Pangeo, which is where I first met Matt Rocklin and learned about Dask. Pangeo is a loosely organized group of scientists that advocate for a new cloud-based way of working together. And Dask has always been a key part of Pangeo because it allows us to abstract data structures and work with very large data sets. I collaborate and I wanna be able to collaborate with other people regardless of their affiliation or location. I want instantaneous access to cloud-based data to open up computers on different clouds. And I wanna build my analysis on top of advanced tools already built by the open source community. And that's probably like a lot of you all, but I maybe feel an urgency that's quite personal. Um, I live in Santa Rosa, California, and I've evacuated three out of the last four years with the glass fire coming within 900 meters of our home last year. I've stood in our driveway at 4 a.m. trying to listen on the car radio to find out what's happening because there's no power, no cell service, no Google Maps. And every few seconds, just the sound of explosions as propane tanks exploded. And we've gathered up the kids and the dog and fled in what we thought might be a safe direction. And this really put climate change and the impact on our lives in a different perspective for me. We need to urgently change how we're doing science to understand climate impacts and prepare. We need to reimagine science now. I wanna challenge you to remove barriers to science and move the community forward towards open science because there's a climate imperative to do so. So this is a science world that I came from just a few years ago where you know a lot of people still work. Closed software results in redundant efforts. It's error prone because less people test it and it reinforces institutional advantages 
We run analyses on local cyber infrastructure with compiler specific operating system in unique environments with closed code. And this makes it really hard to work with anyone outside of our institution, sometimes outside of our own research group. And again, this reinforces institutional advantages where larger institutions can afford advanced cyber infrastructure. Research results are often published behind paywalls, restricting the access and perpetuating exclusionary practices. And again, these institutional advantages where large institutions have negotiated access and discounts for publishing. And who gets to participate? I mean, here's three answers from the science community that only work for part of our population. And they're all answers, but they're clearly not the best solutions. I use AI to create transcripts of science team meetings where it gets the men's identified I use perfectly. Mark is Mark, Tom is Tom, but apparently all the women apparently sound the same and pretty much it just thinks that we are all Carol Ann. And the first time it was a little bit funny, but after a year, it's really getting tiresome. So can we break away from this? Can we move towards a new way of doing science? I think that open science is the answer and that it can help us do that. So working together, we can make the impossible possible and technology can help us bridge those gaps that we wouldn't otherwise be able to get across. Open science has more, the projects have more connections and they include more people and this amplifies their impacts. So what's changing? And this is sort of laid out in our paper through a web browser running on any internet connected device. I can access a coding environment populated with all of my favorite open source libraries up to hundreds of machines and petabytes of data. And as an oceanographer, I can do this, which to me is pretty groundbreaking. It's just stunning, honestly. I'm not a computer scientist or a 20 year old computer prodigy. In this world, I can be a scientist and I can focus on my science questions because the biggest hurdles to access the powers of these collaborative data platforms have mostly been removed. The advanced software libraries and cloud optimized data formats and cloud server farms for data proximate computing are mostly just invisible to me. And so now I'm going to address those core tools again of data, software, and computers, but now looking at it from the new way, which is open science. So like new is there's open cloud-based data, and this dramatically increases our ability to collaborate. And it increases the reproducibility of our results. The access isn't bandwidth limited so that it doesn't depend on whether you're on the NASA backbone or whether you're on an Australia or an island in the Pacific, it's not bandwidth. It enables interdisciplinary research. And this, this just fundamentally broadens participation. And the old way has all these issues that are just disappearing with this new cloud-based open science approach. We don't have to maintain these big local databases. So also, open source software. So we have the data and we want to do some analysis. We want to use open source software. And these are just amazing, powerful tools for scientists like X-Ray and Dask and PyTroll and SciPy and Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow. The open source libraries of the past, they may have been less than the available commercial tools like MATLAB or IDL, but the open source software of today has thousands of active contributors fixing bugs, writing documentation, extending functionality. And I believe it's far surpassed the commercial tools and it continues to grow. And I would say Dask is a perfect example of this. These tools are increasing access to science by abstracting the data access and providing easy to use toolkits for scientific visualization and analysis. The things that I can do with some of these libraries would have taken me months to write from scratch in any other language. And we can bring all of this together. We can bring the user to the data through a web browser through the cloud, the data to a massive server farm, and it can be on a cloud or an HPC based infrastructure. Science data platforms are advancing rapidly and there, there seems to be a new one coming out every month or so, but 
Most of them are based on the Jupiter hub as the primary mode of interface. And this, this is really transformative because it gives users a common framework no matter where they work. You don't have to learn a new environment every time you move computers or every time you move environments. This really gives you science on the cloud. And it gives you a supercomputer behind every device. And this just breaks down the institutional advantage and opens up access to science for more people to participate. And this shows on the left hand side, this is one of my kids, like they have this little Cano $36 computer that we put together and I installed a open source operating system on it. And it has a basic browser. And so we're able to go and open up um, Jupyter Hubs on both AWS and on Google Cloud. And we're like running 80 workers and analyzing almost you know 250 gigabytes worth of data on this little tiny $36 computer, which is pretty amazing. And people are doing this on the train and on their phones, and they're looking at their DAS task streams. And this is just really, really transformative for science. It makes it so easy and so accessible. And one of the things that we wanna do as we move to this new open way of doing things is to really make sure that we're open by design. We wanna build our community and we wanna incentivize openness. We wanna highlight early adopter activities to motivate a broader community. And we wanna coordinate this and move together forward forward together. And this, this is really hard. This is a struggle. And the open science community, in some ways, one of its strengths is that it's really fragmented. But these communities are really starting to build great science. And we need to move more science towards open science. And this is sort of a call to institutions and agencies to think about making 2020 year 22 the transformation to open science year, where we can all work together to transform our agencies and transform our communities and transform our impacts. And I think open science is the way to do that. And it's really uh, transformed my science, it's transformed my workflow and it's transformed my community in ways that uh, I want more people to experience. So thank you. I wanted to keep this short because I know that everyone has a long day of screens in front of them. So we can now uh, have a conversation. So thank you. Cool, thank you, Shel. Um, if people have questions, um, maybe raise your hand. I think Jim can probably unmute you. Or you can also put them in the chat. Give people some time to, to come up with their questions. Hi, thanks for this very nice and very encouraging talk. Um, and I think you touched on a lot of really good points about uh, the open uh, software and, and how that's helping a lot of researchers. I wonder if you could discuss a bit your view on, on infrastructure and how, how we access and how we you know, um, provision you know, resources to, to, to do this science, whether you know, getting access to cloud resources, paying cloud providers or HPC, you know, what's, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think that this is a real growing area there's a lot of pop-up companies where you can essentially get a Jupyter Hub set up for yourself or for your institution. Uh, I see a number of different approaches. I see larger institutions building out their own uh, cloud-based infrastructure for their scientists. And that's one way to do it, where they're just charging each scientist some amount of overhead for access to these resources. Uh, there's also ways that you can use COILED, you can use 2i2c, there's Saturn, 
there's smaller companies that are specializing in provision, you know, providing access to institutions, research groups, or individuals. And there, you can also, you know, you can go to the cloud and provision your own Jupyter Hub. But at least for me, setting up the the real transformation for me has been that you know, a year or two ago, trying to go and set up a Jupyter Hub myself. It's really intimidating. It's a little scary. You've given your credit card over. You have to worry about security. And then you have to set up the environment and set up Kubernetes. I think now that there's enough of these smaller companies that are popping up, uh, and some of them are becoming larger companies, uh, that now you can just go online and create whatever world you want. And I think there's a lot of companies working to provide that for scientists as well as small companies. And I think that's sort of where the future is. I think where we need to be a little careful is we wanna make sure that as we give business to these companies, that they're companies that support open science and they're maybe somewhat vendor agnostic so that we don't get locked into things. I think it's really critical that these platforms that are building on Jupyter Hub, which is an open source project, like we need to make sure that we feed back towards and support the open source libraries and the open source community. And so that whatever decisions we make about cyber infrastructure, that we don't just take from the open source community, but we contribute as well. Thanks. Cool, thank you for that. Um, I have another question that came in on chat, which is um, how do you deal with people who want to continue with the same workflows that they've used for years? How do you encourage people to move towards this new vision that, you're, that you've expressed? So I moved towards this new vision uh, a little bit accidentally. When I moved companies, uh, I moved from a for-profit to a non-profit and I lost access to 18 years of software. And I said, okay, uh, I can either try to rewrite all of that software in Fortran, which I knew was a mistake, uh, or I can try to move to Python. And I decided to try to move to Python. And I thought originally, I mean, I had 18 years of workflows set up. I knew how to do the analysis. I knew how to do my science. And I thought that it was gonna be really difficult to recreate all these workflows in a new language, in a new environment. And it was really uh, transformative for me. It, it just, it, I, I ended up just throwing away everything I'd done because I didn't need all of those loops that I had done before. There were tools that would do the means, that would do the group buys. My code has become completely different. I'm writing in a different way because when you start to use Python and when you start to use the higher level libraries like X-Array and Dask and Scikit-Learn, you find that a lot of your old workflows, there's no need to translate them. You just almost have to, you know, in baby steps, maybe that's what you do is you start to recreate your results. And then what you realize is you can do it far faster, more accurately and more clearly when you start to use higher level tools like X-Array and Dask. And so, I sort of took a baby step where I, I recreated and there was a lot of, there's a lot of for loops in my early Fortran Python code. And then I just moved completely away from that workflow. So it's, it's a leap of faith. I think I saw a raised hand, but then it just went down. Did someone else have a question they want to ask? Um, another one came in. Okay, yeah, see the hand. Okay, uh, I have the same question. Uh, uh, just touching on your last answer, you said that for open and reproducible science, we can also use these smaller companies who allow Jupyter Hub and access, uh, easy access to these services. But how do you think we can make sure that those scientific experiments can be reproducible after like 10 years or something? Because you, you, you can expect not a lot of these vendors to be available at that point. I hope so I, I think, was clear with my question. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that is a really good question. And I think that trying to make something reproducible in 10 years is probably asking a lot, given the way that things are moving. There's ways that you can make things more reproducible 
that can help with that problem. And I would like to focus on just the reproducibility now issue. Right now, most publications don't provide their code and their results aren't reproducible now. So if we can set a realistic goal of just making results real reproducible now, they may not be reproducible in 10 years, but at least we have a path and we have a way that we knew it was reproducible at a certain point and we can try to recreate that. If you're going with a small company that's providing access to a Jupyter Hub, you know, a right to replicate if that company provides that is going to be important so that they provide information on how to replicate that environment. But right now, especially if you're running on a Jupyter Hub, you can create an environment file that you know, lists all of the libraries necessary to run your code and the versions that you're using. And you can use a binder. Uh, so if you know mybinder.org, you put in the link to your GitHub uh, repository and you can create a sort of ephemeral instance that runs on AWS or Google Cloud. There's different binders for different clouds and you can make your results reproducible that way. So right now I'm trying, and I, I see this more and more in scientific publications, people create a release of their GitHub code for that paper, and they create a release on Zenodo, and then they get a DOI for that code. And then they also add a binder link to that repository so that it's instantly, at least right now, it is reproducible and they have access to the data, the software, and they can recreate your figures and results. And I think if you're going towards a smaller company or even a larger company, you have to make sure that most of them are building on these open tools. So the more that you can stay towards vendor agnostic, open source tools, it's the more likely that your results will be reproducible over the long term. Um, a few more from chat. Um, so what is the biggest barrier to getting off on-premise systems to adopt a cloud-first model? I think right now the biggest barrier, at least that I'm experiencing, is uh, going to the cloud, the, the, the computation, the cyber infrastructure is there. And the biggest difficulty is the data isn't quite there yet. Both, uh, I mostly work with uh, space-based data, so satellite data, it comes from NASA, NOAA, ESA, JAXA, all the space agencies and meteorological agencies, um, UMETSAT, and they are starting to move their data onto the cloud, but they're just starting to, so some data sets are there, not all of them. There's groups like uh, Pangeo, which has the Pangeo Forge, which is working to create cloud-optimized and cloud-deployed versions of different data sets. Uh, the, the agencies are all working towards rapidly towards getting their data on the cloud. And I think as more data starts to populate the cloud, it's going to be easier to move from on-prem because the biggest advantage right now that I have when I work on-prem is that I have, you know, a hard drive that sits next to my computer that has, you know, 16 terabytes of data that I spent a year downloading. And I need that data to be on the cloud to really move all of my analysis there. So I think the next question. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so the next question is, taking a step back from all the packages in the ecosystem, do you think that Python uh, as a language is a, is like special among programming languages for open science? Like other than eco ecosystem, like what else is unique about Python that makes it good for this? At least for me, Python was very accessible. If you're coming from uh, if you've done MATLAB, it was a really easy transition. There were a lot of tools like Matplotlib where I immediately already knew how to plot things. So for me, it was an easy transition. I know that there's a lot of other interest in open-based languages. There's a lot of people who use R, people are using um, Ruby. And I, I think that the key is, is that it's open, it's an open-based language and the, the reason that I have focused on Python is at least for science, the open source tools that are developed for Python have sort of 
uh, just made it explode in popularity and it's becoming this snowball rolling downhill where there's more and more people using it, creating tools for it. And it's become the default language. Now, it may be the default language only for the next 10 years. I don't know. I think that for certain uh, machine learning and AI applications, there's other languages that are slightly better, like Julia is another language that people are moving towards. But right now, the tools that exist in Python, especially for doing science, really um, make it the default language for open science. Yeah. So um, next question is, how do you address the build it here syndrome that is common at many government slash national labs? Yeah, you got to fight the good fight. Um, I think that I already see this happening uh, at a lot of government and national labs and large research institutions where they're trying to uh, you know, replicate their closed environment again to get an institutional advantage, uh, build it here, and they're taking from the open community and not necessarily contributing back. And I think that it is the users have the power here. There's more of us than there are of them. And that wherever we can don't, you know, the, the invent it and they will come model never works. It's been shown over and over it doesn't work. And that the scientists and the users who drive development, which is what's happening in the open community, is when it really starts to work and be transformative and be adopted by everyone. So I think that as much as we can advocate for our own needs within our community, so within your national lab and within your institution to advocate supporting open science and using open cloud-based resources, the better off we're gonna be in five to 10 years. Um, so how do you deal with more sensitive data where privacy matters, for example, in medical or healthcare data? I think that, I mean, there's a, there's a couple different issues wrapped up in that question. You know, there, for publication, right, I deal with earth science data and almost all of our data has to be public. It's been public for about 20 years now. There are some areas now where they're starting to buy data from commercial companies where there's restrictions on the use and that's an issue for science. I know for healthcare and for medical, there's a lot of issues with privacy. And I think that if the issue is security, then just because the data is on the cloud doesn't mean it's not secure. You can put it in an S3 bucket that has very uh, strict permissions so that you have, so that it is secure. You know, the DOD, um, the Pentagon, both have uh, private clouds on within AWS and within Microsoft. And uh, so you can have secure data on the cloud. You just have to set your permissions right. And that's where, you know, you really need to make sure that you're working with someone who set up your hub and set up your environment that understands how to do security issues. And then you're only giving access to people who know how to use that data and maybe know how to um, make it more anonymous when they're doing their results. So just because you're on the cloud doesn't mean that everything's public. And I think that as long as you can still publish your results, you show how you analyze the data, then you could, you're, you're fine. Okay. Um. So this one is, in science, part of the problem is that people are reluctant to spend time and money on good infrastructure, instead doing things quickly and in a one-off manner to crank out papers. How do you shift the culture so that good infrastructure and the people who create it are also valued? I think that's really a key problem of what we have to address. And right now, the way that promotions are given and the way that evaluations are done in academia, but as well as within uh, research institutions and agencies, it's often individual based and awards are individually, they recognize an individual. I don't think that's, it goes back to this time in the past where they had this vision of this one great scientist and that great scientist drove us forward. I don't think that's how science actually works. And science is a team effort. There's very, I think I only have one 
one author paper. Every other paper I've written has been with a team of people. So we need to make sure that the awards, the evaluation criteria, the advancement criteria begin to reflect how science actually works, which is contributions to community contributions are just as important as science. They are our scientific contributions. And in science, maybe we want to separate out a little bit who is doing science and who's working on infrastructure and value them equally, because we can't do great science without great infrastructure and without all of that cyber infrastructure to help us. The tools that we use with X-ray and DAS that are allowing us to do these massive analyses and learn about our weather and climate more rapidly than we've been able to in decades, that those people need to be recognized. We need to make sure that we cite uh, the software libraries when we do publications. And as a scientist, it's your responsibility to really make sure that you give credit where credit is due to all of these software libraries and infrastructure developers. So I think the shift in culture is really gonna depend on us shifting how we value each contribution and making sure that the value recognizes how teams are actually working together today. Okay, so this one's a little more technical. Um, what was your initial experience using Dask in your work, especially learning Python and moving away from Fortran? It takes some reimagining to translate single machine to distributed computation. Yeah. Uh, lightness and joy, uh, just complete and utter joy when learning Python. It, at first, when I started learning Python, I was programming in Python like I would program in Fortran which I didn't have to have all the declarations at the beginning, but I was basically just construct, I, I wasn't using any open source libraries and maybe other than the NetCDF library and NumPy. I was using pretty basic libraries. And so at first it was really frustrating because I didn't, I actually didn't understand why people were so excited about Python. It just seemed like another syntax to me. And it was really the day that I learned about X-Ray that this changed for me. And I attended a Pangea workshop and saw about how X-Ray and Dask allowed me to do um, calculations with data that were larger than the RAM that I had on my computer. And all of a sudden that just really, everything clicked together. And it's not so much me reimagining how I program as just being able to program. And uh, most of the time, X-Ray and DAS just takes care of everything for me. It does the parallelization. And, and I'm, I come from you know, a, an operational background where I was always concerned about RAM. And I was breaking big parts of data down into small parts of data. And I had a main program and then all of these sub programs and I was collecting everything and trying to put it all together at the end because every analysis I did had to stay within the RAM on that computer. And when I was trying to do big analyses, I was managing all this myself and it was really hard. And so when I moved to Python, and found X-Ray and Dask and realized that that had all been done very elegantly for me. It, it, it really just made it all worthwhile. I don't, th I think there's just this point where it's a little bit of a struggle and it's a struggle. And then it becomes so easy that uh, you don't have to worry so much about the distributed computation until you get to more advanced analyses. Um, Initially, you can really let X-Ray and DAS take care of it for you. Um, so climate risk is an industry, as an industry is arguably exploding changes to climate related financial disclosure. How do you get the IP lawyers in these organizations to understand and value open source and pay back resources funds into open source? I think that Companies uh, can allow their developers to contribute and work with open source uh, software libraries, be part of the open source community. I think that allowing them to work, you know, if they're using these libraries to allowing them to work and contribute one day a week or a half day a week. I think that, I mean, there's, 
it's not necessarily like, I know that there's intellectual property issues. And when you work for a company, you're going to have to navigate that, but you're, you'll have to, I think that companies are going to have to figure out a way to permit their uh, developers to contribute to open source libraries by perhaps doing, um, you can uh, allow exceptions um, so that certain days a week, they're not under IP rules for the company that they can, or that they're allowed to contribute to open source. And that's something that it's not just uh, industry that's dealing with that. Uh, universities also have IP laws. Uh, if you're in the federal government, if you're a federal employee, you can't claim intellectual property as part of your workday. And that's actually the opposite problem because you can't actually give a copyright, you can't release it. Um, these are really sticky issues. I'm not a lawyer, but I do know lawyers. <laughs> and I, I think that they're working on this. And I think that we have to uh, push the institutions to find paths forward. This one's um, kind of similar, but how do we encourage funding agencies to value the importance of software and cyber infrastructure? And do you think they value it currently? I would say that starting maybe three or four years ago, I wouldn't say that there was a large recognition of the importance of open source software and cyber infrastructure to the larger agencies. I think, you know, maybe four or five years ago is when this all started to change. And now there's uh, agencies are giving funding out and releasing funding to support open source software. So I've seen calls from NSF. I've seen calls from NASA. I believe DOE is supporting open source software development a lot. I think that all of the many of the federal agencies are moving towards that direction. I think they can be encouraged to move faster and to do it more. Uh, I think NOAA is working towards that as well. And this is again a place where people within those institutions and scientists who use the data from those institutions can advocate for their needs very powerfully. So if you can advocate for that within your agency, I think you should because I think that they will be receptive to it now. And, you know, this is really where we start to, you know, change things because these federal agencies, they're powerful and they can set community norms. We can ask and we can advocate for open source software, but they actually hold the ability to give money out for grants. And when they require open source software as part of their grant proposal, that's where we really start to see communities change quickly. And some of those agencies are starting to require open source software for any grant funding that they give out. All right, we have one more question. Um, so how do, oh wait, I think I lost it. <laughs> okay, let me go back. I think it was something about Pangeo. Uh, uh, I see. I think it was about open communities oh, yeah. versus okay. open development. Yeah, I, I glanced at it right before it disappeared. Yeah, so, yeah. Could you speak to the difference between open source versus open development and um, in terms of entraining user communities? And how has, how has Pangeo become so successful, basically? Yeah. Yeah. I think that open science, open source, open development, I think that you can use those terms to mean a move towards openness. And whether you're doing open development on software or open science, where you're trying to have your entire work for and publications be open, we can just talk about it as moving towards open. And I think the reason that Pangeo has been so successful is that it's a very deliberately designed open science community. It has codes of conduct. It makes an effort to be inclusive and it makes an effort to do everything openly. So there's communications, you can search on communications and questions. They have a discourse, they have Gitter, they have uh, weekly seminars. So they're trying to meet, in some ways I would say Pangea's 
trying to outreach and meet the community as much as possible where they're at in language that they understand. And I think that's one of the reasons Pangeo has been so successful is they've done a lot of outreach where people are at and trying to meet them there and then showing them these new tools and this new way of doing things in a way that doesn't talk down to them and isn't preaching to them, but is just showing this transformational way to do science. And it's not just doing open science for the sake of doing open science. It's doing open science because you're going to have your results faster and they're going to be more accurate and they're going to be more reproducible. And that for a scientist, that's usually what you care about. So if you can, if you can show me how to do that, then I'm going to figure out how to do that. And that's why I think Pangeo has been so successful is it's been really, um, doing a lot of outreach within the science community at their level, at a language they understand, and bringing them into the open science community. The other thing that I think is really important with Pangeo is that Pangeo brought scientists and developers together. And a lot of times you have scientists trying to do open science over here, but they're not really starting to work with the open source software libraries that they're using and there's not this feedback and Pangeo partnered and supported a lot of those software projects and that partnership and support of those software projects started to advance those projects and the science so we had we had it wasn't just trying to solve a problem to solve a problem we had definite problems that we were having doing science and we had the developers that we could work with to find solutions and that that was really successful, I think, as a model for future projects where you, you're not, you, you have a little bit of overlap and you work together to solve problems. And this goes back to that valuing the cyber infrastructure and the cyber developers just as much as the science, because really we're solving this together. Awesome. Um, there are no more open questions, so I'm going to invite uh, if anyone has a last minute question, you're welcome to put it. Um, but I'm also going to invite everyone to uh, come together where we can carry on this conversation. Um, so I'm putting the link in the chat. And thank you, Shell. That was that was really interesting. Um, I really liked how it was, I liked the Q and A section a lot. So thanks for doing that. Thanks. Yeah, this was really interesting. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at Gather Town. <laughs>